My name is James Cape, and I'm the current president of the Intel Alumni Network, and I will be your moderator for today's Life After Intel event. This particular event focuses on how best to enjoy and serve the great southwestern deserts for which I am a deeply passionate advocate, hence we're doing this event. Call it my pet project, but that's okay. Um, we could even call me a desert rat, which is the name my mother gave me on one of the many camping trips to Death Valley we had starting at around eight years old. Ever since that time, I have never gotten tired of getting lost in the grandeur and solitude of the great Southwest. And there's a quote that comes to mind for me from Teddy Roosevelt, who really is the father of all of our public lands protection activities. That quote goes as follows. The father, the further one gets into the wilderness, the greater is the attraction of its lonely freedom. And with that, let me introduce our panelists for today. With a big warm welcome to Dave Pacheco and Jenny Holmes from the Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance, Mitch Fry, president of Friends of Gold Butte National Monument, and Jim Boom, fellow desert rat, scientist, and creator of birdandhike.com. As we get started, let me provide you a bit of context on the history of public land conservation efforts in the US. It all begins again with Teddy Roosevelt and the successful passage of the Antiquities Act in 1906. This act established the first general legal framework for protecting cultural and natural resources in the United States. It's safe to say that Many of us would not, may not have had the opportunity to visit great national parks like Zion and Grand Canyon and Yellowstone, just to name a few. Since then, the Antiquities Act has provided a roadmap for the passage of numerous other pieces of legislation, expanding protections to our public lands. And those bills were passed by both Democrats and Republicans. Fast forward to today, and there are many organizations that are involved with conservation, including government at all levels, tribal nations, professional and scholarly groups, and local communities. We are here today to discuss how Intel alums can enjoy our public lands, while at the same time, get involved in helping to protect and preserve them. Because trust me, they will not protect themselves. We as citizens need to play our role as well. So let me move to our panelists now, starting with Dave and Jenny, then Mitch, and finally, Jim. Please, each of you introduce yourself and your organizations. Dave, take it away. There we go. Uh, thank you, James. We really appreciate the invitation to come and join the Intel Alumni Network this evening. Um, we really appreciate the introduction. Uh, the Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance uh, is an organization that I've worked for for over 20 years. Um, I am a grassroots organizer. I am the Utah organizer on our team. So I focus on educating and organizing uh, efforts to protect these wild Utah lands uh, from our Salt Lake City office. Um, I'll go into a detail here about the organization in a moment. Um, Mike, could you roll the slides? we got some slides here to show you some pretty pictures to show you about what it, kind of lands we're talking about uh, and some of the actions that we're taking. Um, uh, there we go. It's coming up there go. for you, Dave. There you go. Okay, so um, again, I am with a group called the Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance. I greatly appreciate it. If you have any uh, questions at the end or want to contact me later, you see my email on the screen there. I'm Dave at suwa.org. Um, next. So as a nonprofit organization, our approach is to kind of put it in layman's terms, a, a two, two sides of the same coin. We play offense and defense at the same time. We advocate for the protection of the remaining Bureau of Land Management wildlands inside the state of Utah. We do that through legislation in the US Congress through a, a bill called America's Red Rock Wilderness Act. And Jenny and I, who you'll meet Jenny in a moment, are on our organizing team and I focus on Utah. Jenny's focus is the West Coast. So I think that a lot of you are probably from that area. And so she has a special message for you. 
but we literally try to get these lands protected legislatively. And we do that through the US Congress because we're talking about America's public lands here, lands that are owned by all Americans and enjoyed by all Americans. This is how we have great protected areas across the West as people get involved from the national parks to advocacy for our national monuments, uh, including uh, in this conversation, Bears Ears National Monument, which you may have heard about, Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument, both in South, uh, Central and Southeastern Utah. And they're a little uh, North and East of the lands that Mitch and Jim are gonna be talking about in Gold Butte National Monument, which is down in Southern Nevada. It takes advocacy, it takes voices. These lands can't protect themselves. And Jenny's gonna focus on that a little bit more. At the same time, we play defense. We work to keep these lands protected from intrusions that would alter them, that would develop them. The normal culprits, as you could imagine, the biggest thing that's happened to our wildlands across the country have been just people developing them for a variety of reasons, oil and gas, fossil fuel extraction being primary among them, but also we're just loving our lands to death uh, through outstanding recreation, um, through through means that you know we were way out there in the desert, no one's watching, and we tend to take advantage of it. And it's kind of protecting these lands from ourselves to some degree. So we watchdog the Bureau of Land Management in Utah to keep these lands protected. We approach the uh, protection legally when we have to. And we also have a stewardship program that will allow that allows people like you to spend some time actually getting to know these lands and giving something back while you're there. We do restoration projects. We do uh, projects that the BLM doesn't have the staff to do. And so we rely on volunteers like yourselves to come out and enjoy these places. Um, next slide. <clears throat> Just a couple examples here. Um, this is the Green River uh, out in South Central Utah. It's the lands around the Green River here that we're talking about that we're working to protect. Next. This is the Escalante River down in South Central Utah. This is part of Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. Uh, I, I love to do this work because um, we're really um, blessed with the, uh, the support of a lot of nature photographers who donate their work to us so that we can use these sorts of images that are done by professionals um, in presentations like this. Next. Yes, we can designate them as protected zones, but that doesn't mean we can't go there. Uh, this is the Green River again through Labyrinth Canyon. Uh, and as you can see, uh, it's one of the, the last free flowing rivers in the area. Um, the dam doesn't happen. Uh, the dammed rivers don't happen between Flaming Gorge Reservoir in Northern Utah and Glen Canyon Dam at the very bottom of the state. And the Green River flows through the entirety of the state and, and it can be paddled from border to border. Next. These are lands for us to enjoy. We are able to kind of span generations by showing folks that you know these are their lands. Uh, and there are very accessible places that we can go and have memorable moments like, uh, like James was explaining before when he was a kid. Uh, I have very much the same sorts of memories. And I think most others here on our panel have similar sorts of memories. So uh, they're there, these lands are there for us to enjoy, but also it's our responsibility to protect them on the front end, defend them on the back end and give something back in the process. So next. Just wanna give you a graphic image about uh, like, what are we talking about here? So I've got for you a map on the left-hand side of the state of Utah and on the right-hand side, some more images kind of of what these areas look like. So on the map, um, the dark areas on the map, the brown areas are the areas that we're working to protect at the Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance. And not just this one organization, we're in coalition with a lot of other nonprofits across the country. Groups that you know the name of like the Sierra Club, the Natural Resources Defense Council, the Wilderness Society, and many groups along the West Coast uh, who Jenny has worked at bringing the coalition uh, more strength and more people and more voices. The areas on the map in brown are America's Red Rock Wilderness Act. It's legislation before the US Congress. It would designate about 17% of the land in Utah as wilderness areas. 
You can see on the map a few other colors. I just want to show you for locators. The purple areas, Arches, Canyonlands, Capitol Reef, Zion, Bryce. Those are the national parks that you know. Dinosaur in the north part of the state. These lands, these, these national park lands are surrounded by other public lands. And it's those lands, those brown areas on the map that are largely still intact, largely still undeveloped. And of course, the rationale behind that, the reason behind it is that Utah is a very arid place. We're the second most arid state in the country behind Jim and Mitch's Nevada. Uh, we are, uh, because of that, there is less development because water is a, a, an integral resource in order to have development. So that's kind of, we're, we're blessed because of that. And these are the lands that are kind of left over. These are the lands that didn't have the resources that were impacted uh, leading up to probably the 1980s into that area. At that point, we started to inventory the lands and map them and show what was out there. And we've been able to defend the majority of those lands ever since. Uh, you can see in the bottom part of the map, South Central, you can see Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. And over in Southeast Utah, Bears Ears National Monument. Those two big monuments down there. And those are the ones that are similar in management to Gold Butte that Jim and Mitch are gonna be talking about. Next. You can see here, I, I wanted to kind of bring it home to you in terms of like why we wanna protect these large landscapes. And the rationale is that it's important to protect large landscapes to connect other protected lands to these ones. So below Utah in the Southern, you know, just on the Northern Arizona border is the Grand Canyon ecosystem. And to the North is the Central Idaho wilderness and the greater Yellowstone ecosystems. And off to the East is the Rocky Mountain ecosystems, uh, kind of uh, cornerstone by Rocky Mountain National Park. This is the spine of the continent. These mountain ranges link wildlife habitat conservation corridors from the Canadian Arctic all the way down into Mexico. And you can see the reason why we wanna protect Utah's wildlands because they connect and they help bind these wildlife habitat together for all kinds of wildlife that migrate north and south across the spine of the continent. And it's for that reason that we need to think big. And it's a lot of the rationale behind why we want to see these places protected. Next. So the Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance is a nonprofit organization. We're 90% member funded. And if you go to our website at sua.org, there's an easy way to help us out by simply donating. It's one of the biggest things you can do is to give of whatever you can to, to help a nonprofit do this kind of work. You can also join a stewardship project. The stewardship program, we have 22 projects going out on the land uh, this year. We've got them all lined up and we're right now taking applicants to go and give something back for a little bit. The projects are usually two to three or four days in length. They're not long, they're pretty short. We do a couple of the meals in it. All the details are on our website. Uh, and I encourage you to go to the SUA website and check this out because what might happen is if you plan a trip to Utah and center it around one of these stewardship projects, you'll find that you'll have, you'll be there and then you'll have time before or after the project to go investigate and check out some of these places and sit quietly at night and listen to the silence. It's very attainable here in Southern Utah and I encourage that you take advantage of it. Uh, we have a, a video that we wanted to show you here um, and Mike, if you wanna jump on the video, uh, we wanted to kind of show you what happens on these stewardship projects. Volunteering with the Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance and allows you to connect with the landscape. You get to see wilderness, but you also get to see the damages being done to it. The volunteers from these projects are all across the board. They come from a lot of different backgrounds, a lot of different interests. It's one thing to be passionate about an area from afar, but if you come and actually pour your own sweat into the conservation of the land, it gives a little more integrity to your passion. And with that short video, uh, I want to uh, introduce my colleague, Jenny Holmes, who is the Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance's West Coast organizer. Thank you, Dave. Really good to be here tonight. And uh, so um, my, my main message for, for this part of our 
uh, program is that you are the ultimate natural resource for your public lands. Um, and this is something that, that I've learned um, from my family growing up in the uh, Pacific Northwest. Um, I uh, grew up in Portland, Oregon, that, which is where I now live. I've been to Washington, D.C. and Washington State. Um, I became familiar with the Red Rock country on a geology field trip uh, during college and was really wowed by um, the, the beauty of the area and just um, how um, easy it was to see human history and natural history combine in one place. Um, so we spent a lot of time in Capitol Reef National Park, which um, remains my favorite national park. And I've been doing organizing work um, on various issues over the years, including climate change. Um, and um, I'm really excited to be now working on the West Coast, and mostly in the states of California, Oregon, and Washington. So um, it's very easy to take our public lands for granted. Um, and they really are uh, unique in the world, the US public lands in their diversity, ecological importance, their beauty, scientific value, and just in the sheer number of acres that they cover, especially in the West. Um, our protected public lands um, can ground us in values that are beyond um, the more material. And this is something that many of us are more inclined to explore in our later years. Um, but just by the fact of having these lands, it, it's a reminder to us that there's more to life than things that are uh, more on the material level. Um, it, it really is up to us to ensure that all of our public lands are, are managed um, properly for a changing climate and also allowed to serve as a climate solution, enable wildlife to migrate and thrive as Dave pointed out in his presentation that they get the level of protection they deserve, such as wilderness designation for many areas, including uh, Utah's Red Rock, Rock Wilderness that you saw on the map, that they are maintained and improved through proper funding, um, that uh, they respect and appropriately include in their management Native Americans who have stewarded these lands from time immemorial. We're hearing a lot more about the, the history of um, and present day practices of uh, Native Americans with these lands. And it enriches all of us to learn that history and to learn um, their approach to uh, managing the lands um, and to um, ensure that they remain as vital area uh, areas for scientific study, especially in a changing climate. We need some kind of a baseline to understand how the natural world is changing and often nat uh, protected natural areas provide that. Um, and that recreation is managed and balanced properly and much more. So these are all things that are up to us to ensure for public lands. Um, and I wanna encourage um, all of us um, to get to know public lands um, that we visit and the story behind them. Um, knowing the natural and human history of our public lands is a, it's a fun and interesting process. Um, and uh, if you have a, sp a specific area that you especially like, find out how those designated lands, such as the National Monument Park, um, Nat yeah, Wilderness got established. Um, you'll often see that there's some local opposition as there was with the Grand Canyon, which is hard to imagine. Um, uh, and uh, so often that, that uh, designation is later embraced like with the Grand Canyon, Canyon National Park. It, um, it's hard to imagine it not being that. Um, notice how long it may have took to get a special designation Gold Butte was first proposed, as I understand, in 2008 by tribes with, um, who have important relationships and cultural uh, ties to the area. Um, and also another thing to note when you're um, studying the history of, of your lands is uh, the bipartisan support that's usually behind bringing them into to being. Um, so that's a real important legacy. So you can make your voice heard for your public lands in many forms. And it needn't take a lot of 
your time. It really depends on you how much time you'd like to spend. And it can be a really enjoyable, satisfying endeavor to dig into protecting a place and um, you know, following all of the, the news and developments that you can be involved with and really see how citizen action makes a difference, whether it's a management of lands or establishment of, of new wilderness. So it can be as simple as sending um, an email or making a one minute phone call uh, to your member of Congress. Um, the volume of emails, calls and letters on an issue do matter. So don't worry that it's short um, and that you're one of many. Um, it is the overall quantity that can really make a difference. And, and the more, more of us who speak out on something like a bill that we'd like passed or um, something that we want stopped, um, the better. Um, the most impactful thing you can do is to actually meet with the staff or your member of Congress. Um, and the, the later is, is easier than you might think. Um, uh, you, you often are most successful if you do this with a group. Very few people can get a meeting with the office of their member of Congress on their own, but you know, whether you know, it's um, a local conservation group or SUA, um, you, know, you can connect with a group that's following things on the ground and knows when um, citizens can make a difference. So um, in our case, uh, we have um, meetings in, in the district as well as in Washington, DC. And it's those district meetings that I would encourage you, especially on this um, Zoom to participate in. And um, you can start out as an observer and simply say why you care about the lands that we're, we're talking about. In the case of SUA, the America's Red Rock Wilderness Act, um, which protects 8.4 million acres of wilderness quality land. Um, if people, if you've been there, um, you can simply just say, I ask you to representative or senator to protect these lands. They mean a lot to me. I went on a trip there um, with my family and it was one of the best times of our lives. Something like that. So, yeah, hey, Jen, so, hey, Jenny, in the interest of time, can we go yeah. ahead and have Mitch? We can handle some of this in the Q&A section. Mitch, can you go ahead? And here, just for everyone to understand, we'll pop this up at the uh, end of the presentation as well, is this mm -hmm. is how you can help get involved with SUA. And mm -hmm. with that, uh, Mitch, you want to go ahead and uh, give us a brief overview? Sure. Uh, go ahead and run our slides. We'll do that. So. Um, I'm, so I'm Mitch Fry, I'm the current president of Friends of Gold Butte, and we're a, a smaller organization. We are dedicated to um, kind of, we're mostly stewardship and education oriented, um, focused on the Gold Butte National Monument. And so I'm going to do just a sort of a brief um, introduction to Gold Butte itself, which is a fascinating place, and then talk a little bit about Friends of Gold Butte. Um, we do run a small visitor center. You can see the address there in Mesquite, Nevada. Um, you can drop by Monday through Friday, and, and there's always a, a volunteer. It's all volunteer run um, that can talk to you about the monument, give you some hints. Um, down below there, you can see our um, website, which is uh, full of materials, both about the monument and about the organization. Uh, next. There we go. So um, Gold Butte National Monument is a fairly new monument. It was designated in 2016 by President Obama right at the very end of his presidency. Um, it's located just south of Mesquite, Nevada, and it's kind of sandwiched right between um, other um, conservation lands. So uh, to the east of us is the Grand Canyon Parashant National Monument. Um, to the south and west is the Lake Mead um, National Recreational Area. And um, Gold Butte kind of has the, the smallest little piece of the Grand Canyon that would be considered in Nevada um, as a, along the Colorado, right along the borders there. Uh, next. So when you get out to Gold Butte, it's um, just filled with amazing geography to geology to look through. You can see some of the rock formations are um, great places to go out and hike around. And uh, just because the formations are so interesting, the geology of the area is, is fascinating to study. Um, lots of stuff to see. Next. Lots of uh, desert wildlife out there, in particular some endangered species. We're home to the uh, desert tortoise. Um, there's uh, um, you know, uh, 
occasionally, if you're lucky, you might get to see a gila monster, um, certainly bighorn sheep, um, and of course, snakes during the right time of year. Next. Great flora and fauna in the monument. Um, some of them are rare species. Um, during a blooms, it can be just gorgeous out there. Um, but then if you wander around and learn about the stuff that's in the desert floor, of course, it's primarily desert plants. Although we have everything from um, mountain peaks in um, the Virgin Mountains down to the desert floor. So quite a variety of stuff. Next. And it's filled with a culture, and this is one of the reasons why it was uh, made a national monument, but filled with cultural and historical treasures. Lots of petroglyphs, some, some petrographs. Um, there's hundreds and hundreds of, of uh, petroglyph panels throughout the monument. Um, you know, it's hard not to be somewhere where you don't see some of them. And they're just gorgeous to look at stuff. So, next. And we have a, it's filled with quite a few early mines. None of the mines were really all that successful, but there are lots of mining in there. There was actually it is a ghost, ghost town that was a small um, gold strike that did not last very long, hence the name Gold Butte. Um, lots of early ranchers um, out there. Their ranching is pretty well all ended in the monument, but um, lots of artifacts from the early American stuff in there. Next. So um, Friends of Gold Butte is a um, nonprofit organization. We're a smaller group. Um, we have just one employee in, in the organization. Um, we're primarily a stewardship and education focused organization that um, is dedicated to um, supporting Gold Butte. We work collaboratively with um, BLM, who is the land manager for Gold Butte. Um, but we're also part of a, a much larger advocacy organization. So um, we're part of what's called the uh, Grassroot Friends Network, um, which is about 100 um, organizations very similar to us that support uh, specific um, conservation lands. Um, and so we, um, you know, although our local have a local focus with doing education and stewardship pieces with the local communities, but then we move into advocacy in the larger network structure. Um, Next. So um, if you want to learn a little more about both, our website has a large amount of information, both about the monument and our organization. Um, so the website's there, easy to remember, friendsofgoldbutte.org, although it's a long name to type. And one of the best ways to do this stuff is, is to get your feet on the ground first. Get out to um, some of these public lands and explore them. And that's how you kind of develop your passion for some of this stuff. Um, we do um, quite a large number of both stewardship and education oriented sort of soft education. We do all of our hikes, um, activities in the monument also include some soft education about what's going on. And so all of our events are scheduled up through meetup um, during uh, the season. We, we don't do too much during the summers. It gets way too hot out there. But from you know October 1st through um, about the end of April, um, we usually do, you know, four to eight different sorts of activities each month, and they're all scheduled out through Meetup. So if you uh, go out and join Meetup, you'll get notifications of everything we do. You can um, join us for activities out there when you're in the area. So um, thanks. Great. Thank you Thanks. very Thank much, you. Mitch. And let's, uh, Jim, let's move to you with a brief overview. Yeah, so my name is Jim Boone. I've been uh, living and working in the desert all my life. I uh, I teased James a little bit that I got to Death Valley before he did because I got there before I was born. Uh, some early camping there. I worked for the Park Service, the Forest Service, uh, all different sorts of places, but mostly uh, on public lands here and there. And while the previous speakers have dealt with, with issues at, at national level and regional level, I deal with people more on the individual level. So I have a very extensive website where I provide information about hiking and birding around Las Vegas. So it's birdandhike.com. So if you're ever down this way, um, you can find information on all the best hikes. And what I try to do in a hike description is more than just um, tell people where to go. And what I do is, is try to tell them what to see, what they'll be, um, hiking through, something about the geology maybe, uh, educate them about the flora fauna that they might see, and then uh, have pretty extensive links to other things that, uh, that they might. And so trying to individ influence individuals when they're out um, actually hiking on the ground. And these days I do a lot of 
encouraging individuals to act on their own to do things to uh, benefit our, our shared public lands. So, you know, SUA and Friends of Gold Butte will do organized activities and uh, you'll get, like today, I was out in Gold Butte uh, on a collaborative project with uh, the Clark County and the BLM and Friends of Gold Butte. And we unloaded, uh, I think, eight tons of asphalt into potholes on Gold Butte Road. Um, it's a lot of things like that, encouraging people to get out. Um, but you can you can do things on your own without joining an organized group. So I mean, some things are really simple. You know, you can be the guy that stops and picks up the piece of trash on the ground um, that everybody else walked by. Or if you're driving in the, the back roads and there's a rock in the road and everybody is trying to drive around the road and driving into bushes and widening the road, you can be the guy that gets out of your truck for, you know, 30 seconds and roll that rock out of the road so that people stay on the pavement. And one of the famous, one of the things that really um, I'm passionate about these days, uh, well, these days for the last 10 years or so, are these um, white mining claim markers. They've been abandoned by prospectors who put them up in the 1970s and 80s, and they trap and kill birds and other creatures out on our public lands. And in Nevada anyways, it's legal to go out and knock these things down. And um, I would encourage anybody in Nevada ever finds one of these things to just knock it down, lay it on the ground. You don't have to carry it out. Um, and, you know, in, in protected lands in other states, um, you know, I, it might not be legal, but, you know, knock the damn thing down because it's just out there being a trap for birds and animals. And, uh, you know, if people can get away with just out on their ATVs, driving through the bushes all across the desert and not get caught, well, you know, good and well that we can knock down a pipe or two and uh, and not get caught at that either and, and do something good by it. But, you know, be the person that that does something on your own. Find your own thing that, that you like to do that gives you um, a good feeling about about what you're doing that gives back to the land. Um, you know, maybe you have a passion for plants and you can just identify plants using uh, apps like uh, iNaturalist. And that information is really valuable to the land managers. Uh, maybe you're a bird watcher. You can upload bird sightings to eBird, uh, another phone app, and uh, contribute to science that way. You know, find your thing and, and do it. And you don't have to wait for an organized event to. Uh, for someone else to set up an organized event for you to participate. Let's go out and do something good by yourself. That's, that's, a, that's a great message, you know, to kind of transition here, Jim. You know, I, I can certainly tell you I've been on, I've had the pleasure of being uh, guided by Mr. Boone through uh, various areas of Gold Butte. And uh, besides being just a remarkable national monument, you can also see kind of the wear and tear on the land. And, you know, a lot of times people think the desert is one of the, is because it's so dry and because it's so harsh, it's really, a, it's really tough and resilient. In fact, it's actually a very fragile ecosystem. And that kind of lends me to that kind of my first question that I wanted to propose, ask you guys, and let's go ahead and start you know, the question with in the same order in which you guys did your intros. So over the last 20 years, what are the biggest changes you panelists have seen both positive and negative over that time period. And why don't we go ahead and start with Dave? Well, I'll start with the positive. Um, the single biggest thing that I've seen over the last 20 years is the increase in voices uh, that are coming to the table in support of protecting these places, uh, both on the ground in terms of stewardship out in congressional offices, as Jenny was talking about, uh, in the newspapers, in the press, coming to presentations. There is simply an awareness out there that there are problems in the world, environmentally speaking, the biggest and most obvious of which is climate change. When we say conservation of large protected areas are important, not just for wildlife habitat and to do that biological diversity sort of you know, approach that problem, we're also approaching climate because if you keep the fossil fuels in the ground and you also keep that land preserved, it is resilient itself. It sequesters the carbon from the air 
and people understand that there's more voices, there's more understanding of the problems that we've caused on this planet. And they're right here in our home. We can see them right here in Utah and Nevada. They're, they're very similar problems. We can see them, we can solve them. I think the biggest downside, the biggest problem that has kind of come is the same sort of thing. It's us, we look ourselves in the mirror. We're our own worst enemy in many cases. We simply don't understand that our impacts on the land last they they're you know they're long-term impacts even the, the the very delicate biological soil crusts that are found in both of these states can be impacted just by walking over them simply by driving over them and so it's a lack of understanding a lack of the knowledge of the impact that we're having out there we're loving the lands to death as i said before and i think that we need to acknowledge that and we need to recognize that because the planet is resilient if we acknowledge the problem first off i think we have an, an opportunity to protect it and to to save it and to keep it in the condition that we want to enjoy it in and then it allows plants and animals to continue so i think that we're kind of it's people that are both the problem and the solution that's yeah, that's a great view of, of things dave i mean I, I can certainly tell our audience here that you, when you go out exploring in some of these wild lands you can still see believe it or not the tracks of the Calistoga wagons that the po European pioneers went through the West on. And those ruts, quite literally, are still already there some 100 to 150 years um, after, you know, after people made the journey from the Midwest out to the, you know, out to the wildlands of the Western states from the Rocky Mountains to the coast. So to Dave's point, that's why these lands are so very delicate. And let me go ahead to, you know, Jenny, do you have uh, any particular views here as well? Whoops. Um, yeah, well, I'll just add a little bit to what Dave said. Um, I definitely agree that the diversity of voices um, for public lands is a positive um, development. Um, people that um, previously have been excluded um, from involvement in various ways um, are now um, more active so you know there's like green latinos and outdoor afro um, groups that are helping people who formerly might have felt uncomfortable being in the outdoors or being um, a conservation advocate um, they provided space and a voice for people um, i think that's a very positive um, development and, and more recognition of native americans um, relationship to the land and the voice that they bring um, as as well. Um, and um, the problem of people uh, really wanting to come and visit um, and, ex you know, expanding their usage of these lands, but not knowing how to properly um, and responsibly uh, recreate on these lands is a big problem. Yeah, so let, let me go ahead and segue over to Mitch and to Jim. You know, I, I, when I think about this, you know, it, it kind of aligns, you know, Intel, the Intel Alumni Network used to do all in-person events, and then COVID hit, right? And then we all got sequestered into our house. So my question to you, Mitch, it's kind of following on the last question. What have you seen occurring in the, wild, in the public lands since COVID? Has there been an, an unintended consequence to you know, that pand this pandemic? Um, actually, for us, definitely. And we went through the same sort of things as a smaller group. We did um, almost all of our education. We do these um, speaker series that was done um, live at a local um, uh, community college um, you know, before COVID. And when COVID hit, we had to sort of rapidly scramble to figure out, okay, how, how are we going to do our stuff? And so we shifted, you know, several things like that to online, uh, modified how we did some of our stewardship and uh, hikes by doing distancing and, and stuff. And um, and then since then, and now we've continued with that by, uh, which expands our, our public reach and stuff. Um, from prior to COVID, um, and since we are small, you know, more of a, um, a smaller monument and uh, fairly new, um, we were running, you know, maybe three or four hikes a month, and they would sometimes fill, sometimes not. The the demand for our activities at, during COVID actually escalated. Well, the first year they dropped off quite a bit. 
But then after that first year of COVID, even while we were still pretty much under isolation, um, the demand for our outdoor activities just um, leaped by band. So we were probably doing two to three times as many um, both stewardship projects and, and educational oriented projects out in the monument as we were doing, doing before. Um, they, um, by our agreements with BLM, we only, we keep our sizes small on these. So like our hikes, we only allow 10 people at, uh, on each hike. But so now we're doing, you know, every hike fills and has waiting lists on them that they didn't before. So we're seeing a lot more interest and stuff. And then people are um, seem to be more aware of, of um, you know, when they're out in the monument, just doing simple things like not trashing the monument. Um, earlier, we would go out on track. We do monthly trash pickups and we would fill, you know, trucks, you know, full of just, you know, beer cans and bottles and stuff. And when we go out along the main roads now, there's not nearly as much just discarded trash of that sort, you know, by by the the most of the people heading out there. Now there's still people who run their tracks out there at midnight and dump a whole truckload of a sofa and, and stuff like that we find every now and then. But the general concern about um, the land seemed to be much more um, an awareness for people now. All right. Hey, good. So Jim, uh, let me uh, kind of, let me put a slightly different spin on things. Have you seen anything specific um, during the COVID crisis? Have people gotten better about um, exploring our our public lands, or have behaviors either gotten worse, or have public lands become a bit overrun? And I'm asking you a leading question. Hey, Jim, I think you're muted. Thank you. There certainly has been a, a big increase in the number of people, but. But to be honest, other than just more people, I've really not noticed any big differences. Of course, the places I go a lot are like the places in the background where I might be the only person in a whole valley for a week. Um, so I, I might be a little bit biased on that. But, but you know, for me, the, to, to answer the original question is that the same as Dave had to say, that, that we are the problem and the solution. And that um, it's a problem to get more people on the public lands who aren't familiar with how to live and act and, and um, take care of the land. Um, but it also means that there's a lot more people that are getting out and realizing how precious these lands are and realizing how stunningly beautiful um, they are. And, and then they fall in love and then they're willing to participate in outreach to Congress and their neighbors um, to advocate protecting these places. And when we first started working on Gold Butte, it was like, what's that? And now there's a whole lot of people that, that you know, say this is a stunning landscape. It should have been a national park 100 years ago. Yeah. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, I, I, I can certainly express that. I mean, when I, we, you know, we, we found Gold Butte and the Friends of Gold Butte just by complete accident. And we're just, we were so enthralled by and mesmerized by the beauty of that land that we ended up going back three times and then moved to the Las Vegas area for a month to do more exploring of the, the entire area. So, I mean, this is really a remarkable space as long as we all do our part in order to protect and preserve it. And let me just remind my, uh, my fellow Intel folks that if you have a question, please submit it through the Q&A, a dialog box there at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And we'll keep moving on here. Um, so the question next, at least for me, and I think Dave, you, you kind of spoke to this um, in terms of creating that corridor, that wilderness corridor that uh, is so important for you know, the, the, the spine of the continent. You know, what the, in, in terms legislatively, what will be the most important th thing that needs to happen to, or needs to get done in order to create that? Is it the, the Wilderness Act or is it something more or is it that and a whole lot more? I think it's that and a whole lot more. Um, you know, there's a lot of conservation bills out there in the U.S. Congress, which, are, if we're talking about federal lands, is really kind of the big, uh, the big player here. I mean, because the the Western U.S. is primarily federal land. At least I can tell you that Utah and Nevada are the two highest percentage of federal land in the country. We're also the two most arid, and that's why we have opportunities in large, contiguous places. But it's, it's up to the local uh, conservation groups. And I think that 
that when combined, the groups that are working on protecting habitat in, in central Idaho and in Eastern Oregon and in Eastern Washington and Western Montana and Southern California and Northern Arizona, when all these are linked together um, with an effort like ours in Utah, then collectively we have uh, we have a big voice. And I think what happens is that we begin to approach what scientists are telling us are the important numbers because we have a big task ahead of us. Worldwide, scientists are telling us that in order to have a chance to stave off the worst effects of climate change and the loss of habitat and the loss of biodiversity, we need to, as a planet, protect 30% of the lands and waters in their natural condition to give humanity really a fighting chance to, to survive because we're, we're eating away so many lands worldwide that we've got to put the brakes on and not just put the brakes on, but go backwards and start to rewild places because it's these natural systems that give us the chance as living beings to actually be here on the planet. And otherwise we're in a trajectory that is not, it's, it's not um, you know, sustainable. And we need to hit some of those numbers and what you're seeing with campaigns to protect Gold Butte, to protect Grand Staircase, Bears Ears, Wilderness in Utah are the local examples where people can get involved at the grassroots levels to make a difference locally. And people in other places are doing that. So it really is a grassroots effort and it takes place not just locally, but it's taking place worldwide. And that's the sort of effort that we need to hit the numbers that the famed ecologist E.O. Wilson said was necessary to protect uh, half Earth, half the planet in its natural functioning ecosystem by 2050 to give ourselves a fighting chance. And so these are interim goals that I think we can attain. And I think that locally, collectively, we can do that. Well, in fact, you know, taking off of the point you just made, Dave, in fact, that was one of the reasons why I so much wanted to do this event with groups like SUA and groups like Friends of Gold Butte. What I found after leaving Intel in 2001 is, you know, you can donate to, and I'm not, you know, I'm not saying don't donate to the Sierra Club or the Nature Conservancy or the things like that, but what I have found is that groups like SUA and groups like Friends are really on the ground making things happen. And it's one thing to contribute your money and that that's important and my, my wife and I continue to do that. But it's really getting involved with local groups that are on the ground doing some of the hard spade work that it takes to help protect, help protect these lands. Because as we said earlier, these lands absolutely are not uh, are not going to protect themselves on their uh, on their own. We we have to get involved in in doing that. And again, at least for me, it's smaller groups. You know, I still give money to Nature Conservancy. I still give money to the Sierra Club. But my a lot of my time and effort is focused on groups like this. So if uh, fellow alums, if if you see, you know, just look at your local area. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be Utah, it doesn't have to be Nevada. There are lots of people who are involved with trying to protect what's left of our natural environment um, day to day through smaller organizations that are doing a lot of the heavy lifting um, to preserve the lands that uh, we, at the end of the day, and I've seen this myself, we've kind of been abusing them for a while. But let me want to segue a bit more to kind of a, uh, kind of a more interesting, happy um, explorer note. And ask, start by asking, uh, you know, Jim, Jim, what are the, what's the most, if you were to pick your top three most amazing places in the Southwest deserts that are in need of protecting, what would those be? And I know I'm putting you on the spot there to, to pick and choose, but you're uh, burdenhike.com. So I think you got some ideas about that. So you're asking like what should be the next national park? Yeah, I just I just want to know what what the uh, what do you think the uh, what are the coolest what are your top three coolest places that you've gone and explored in the last year? Oh, I would never admit to that. Yeah, I know you, That's... but I'm, I'm I want you to play favorites. Okay, <laughs> yeah, I want you to I want you to venture a toe into the things that really light your fire when you go out there. 
Okay, well, right now we are in, in the process down here in Southern Nevada of uh, getting another national monument designated. Uh, it's called a Vikwame, uh, which is a Paiute for Spirit Mountain. And so the whole Southern tip of Nevada, as soon as Biden signs the proclamation, he said he's gonna do it. So as soon as he does, it will be a newest national monument. I've been spending some time down there learning about it so I can write about it and add it to my website and give people some insights on what to see and do down there and how to take care of it. So uh, there's some amazing places down there. And, you know, I I drive around and hike around and knock down mining claim markers down there. And I look up in the hills and think, man, if there weren't so many mining claim markers, I'd go hike up there. Um, so that's one. Um, places like my background here, Stone Cabin Valley is just you know, it's just an empty piece of BLM land that used to have a lot of cows on it, and not so many anymore. Um, it's big, it's wide, it's beautiful. It would connect various landscapes together um, if it were protected. Um, that would be good. Okay. But, but you know, one, one thing I would like to interject, um, you know, we talked about we're trashing the public lands. Really easy things for people to, to do to help protect them is when you're out driving, don't drive in the bushes. It's a very, very simple way to help protect the land. Uh, once the bushes are driven over, they're broken down and, and they just, they don't come back. And the other thing is if you're in a popular place, stay on the trails. Just, you know, don't go trampling off um, where a thousand other people have already trampled off. Just stay on the trail, stay on the road, stay on the trail. That's the best things we can do to protect our public lands. It's a very easy thing to do. Thanks, Jim. So in the interest of, you know, beginning to wrap up of this event, um, there's a question here from Pete in South Carolina. And I put this out to the group and see if, if any one of you have, a, have some suggestions here. Is there a, an active coordination that is uh, taking place to try to coordinate the various conservation groups across the country? I mean, I think, Dave, you kind of, you kind of hit on that a bit. But is there, uh, is somebody working to create a, uh, a kind of a national network of like-minded people that want to protect the, the, the remaining public spaces that we have? Well, one thing that we, that is right out, I mentioned earlier, is there is, is a virtually all friends group. So, um, so the organization like ours, there's a, a network called the Friends Grassroot Network that is um, organized by the uh, Conservation Lands Foundation. And there's close to a hundred um, nonprofits like us that are members of that network. And so we all close so far on the advocacy. So, I mean, uh, locally we focus on stewardship and, and education, but for advocacy, well, then we participate in that network um, very much. And so um, there's uh, uh, organized communication between the whole network. And so as new groups like this come up, they can join that network. Um, but uh, you know, I'd say most of the Western sort of friends groups are part of that. They're, they're, the number on the Eastern US are a little smaller in that network, but um, I think there's close to a hundred groups in that right now. Yeah, I know that this, you know, our, this group, the Intel Alumni Network, we're all about creating connections. You know, again, this is one of the reasons why we wanted, uh, we wanted to do this event today. And that uh, we will in the, uh, the the thank you note, we will be sure to send out the uh, the links to you know the the three groups that we we have here uh, today. And let me uh, let me end it because we're you know people are beginning to get off uh, drop off to get to their dinner. Um, any final words? Starting with Dave, what's your call to action for us? What do you want us to do? So I think you can just become a voice by supporting these organizations um you know these are just two of many organizations um i think that getting involved locally with your local groups and then visiting these places uh, go out give something back do some of these stewardship projects budget in a little extra time to go check some of these places out because the experience is going to change your life and uh it's a physical thing it's breathing clean air it's seeing what's out there it's understanding that you can be a part of the solution um, I think that the experience is really, you know, unmatched in terms of something you could do. So get out, um, contact some of these groups, SUA.org, friendsofgoldbutte.org, um, get involved in their stewardship programs, uh, and you'll find other ways to 
to plug yourself in according to whatever your desires are in terms of advocacy, letter writing, congressional, legislative stuff, or simply, like Jim said, acting on your own and going out and making a difference. Right. Now, Jenny, and I assume that you will, you would uh, wholeheartedly agree with what Dave just mentioned. Is there anything specific that you would like <clears throat> the Intel Alumni Network to, to help SUA with? Yeah, I would just encourage you if you haven't um, been on a visit with your member of Congress, um, we're here to help. And there's a lot of support for people that want to take that step. It's a lot of fun. You get to meet neat people through it. And we have a, I have a whole bunch of them coming, coming up for California, if you happen to be in California, and I'd love to have you um, participate that way. But um, Dave summed it up really well. There's a lot of ways to be involved and it all starts with having that experience out on the land and that passion, that experience fuels your um, your advocacy and your storytelling about the place and, and everything else. So great. That's yeah. that's marvelous. Mitch, any parting thoughts for the for for the group here? Just sort of the same thing. I mean get your boots on the ground is the best way to to find what you want to do and then do a little bit of research and find out who are the organizations in your area and contact them. Yeah, go, find the organizations and go to burdenhike.com. Jim Boone, a final thought. Yeah, yeah. So rather than just going out and, and hiking to climb a mountain or walk to a lake or something, find some way to hike with a purpose. Um, do, do something useful or good along your way. And, and, and lastly, you know, I, I don't collect money, um, but I see what happens. And I've come to realize it's relatively easy to get grant money to do projects, but it's very difficult to get grant money to run organizations. And uh, if anybody has extra money, uh, Friends of Gold Butte could sure use it. Yes, my, my, my wife and I are gonna continue to be active contributors and I'll keep badgering our membership as well. And with that, Mike, I think we are at a good concluding point. Thank you both very much. And could our panelists, as people uh, log off, 